And the topics that tend to have the highest levels of subjectivity are papers that are about pollution, papers that are about climate change, papers that are about health. So specifically, I want to talk about a project in progress where we're trying to evaluate causes and effects of language use. And the current study is of 180,000 peer-reviewed articles in the top journals. So on the science side, it's like Nature, Science, Proceedings of the National Academies of Science. These are, these are competitive journals. And then economics, it's also top journals, general interest journals that we all want to publish in, American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, also field journals in environmental economics, um, the top field journals, um, so that we can get a bigger sample of papers that are about the environment. So these are papers that are about the environment or something else, so we have comparison groups, and they're papers that are, that are, that are hard to publish in. They're, you know, 5% acceptance rates, et cetera. Okay, and so in this, and what I'm doing is we focus on abstracts. So we're going to use machine learning to read in abstracts, and we're going to score them based on how subjective the abstract is. Okay. Um, so, what is our concept of subjectivity? And this is this is important. I think subjective statements are statements that do one of three things, and maybe all three things. So they express personal feelings or opinions, okay? They provide unclear metrics. Like there's huge changes in the ecosystem, okay? It's not a clear metric. Um, or they advance normative views, so there's some policy prescription embedded in the language, okay? So those, we're gonna characterize those as subjective. So here's an example. So you could, you could make the following expression, you could say, the mean temperature is rising at an alarming rate. Or you could say, the mean temperature is rising at an increasing rate. You could say, the mean temperature is rising at a tolerable rate. So B is falsifiable. It's like you could, you could make that statement and you could be objectively correct. Well, you could be objectively wrong. It could be falsified. A and C are not fals falsified because I have a different view of what's tolerable and I have a different view of what's alarming. And, Etc. You all have different views about that. Okay, so that's an idea of how we're trying to um, conceive of subjectivity. Okay, does this does this kind of language matter? Does it matter if we're if scientists are using subjective expressions? I think it matters. I think it matters for two reasons. One is that the advancement of science, the core of science, requires in fact, it's defined by rejecting falsifiable claims. I mean, that's one definition of science that I find persuasive. It's, it's the rejection of hypotheses. And a hypothesis to be rejected has to be objective. So it's the core of science. And I also agree with George Orwell, who said, if thought corrupts language, language could also corrupt thought. So we, we get in a pattern of, of using loose language that contains our personal feelings, and then it, and it carries forward. It affects how we think. Um, okay, so why would, why would a scientific researcher, social scientist or other kind of scientist, why would they use subjective language? Well, we can think of four reasons. There might be some, there might be some penalties, but here's four potential rewards. So one is just to avoid being objectively wrong. So lawyers make a living doing this, right? Like they, they speak in ways that, um, where they can't be disproved. And it's an art. Uh, sometimes they see it in, um, in research as well. Um, but that doesn't advance science if you can't put it out there to be wrong, then your contribution is, is likely to be small. Um, the, other, the other reasons are, are related more to advocacy. So you could advance, a, you could use a subjective language to advance your cause, okay? And that, that you know, you, you could view like that's your charge. I'm an environmental scientist, I'm an environmental economist. 
I love the environment. I think it needs to be preserved. I'm anxious about climate change. We need to do something. So you can use this kind of language and embed it in your, in your scientific paper to advance a cause. You can try to use it to communicate importance. So I say, like, you know, I, 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 I'm an editor at, you know, journals and I referee articles a lot and I see my students research and a lot of like early sentences in their introduction will say, you know, you know, the, the, the loss of, you know, forests is, you know, the most, you know, challenging environmental problem in 50 years. So they're using that kind of language to communicate the importance of what they're doing. And that's, that's another reason. You could, you could use it to single, signal membership in a club hey, I'm concerned about these important things, um, or ideological, you want, you want policy changes. And so who are you signaling to? You're signaling to the referees, the people who are going to review your paper. You're signaling to the editor, um, who's going to decide if your paper gets published. And then if your paper does get published, you're signaling to the outside world um, these things. So, so those, are, those are some ideas about why we would why would be why people would be motivated to use subjective language? All right, this is the densest slide I have, and I won't actually say much about it. But you're probably wondering how do you measure subjectivity, and so there's different uh, possibilities that we have explored in the research. I'm doing this with a um, very technically proficient um, PhD student um, who's interested in building a career around lang uh, large language models. Um, so you can imagine like, oh, like a starting point, an old school starting point, say, well, let's take a dictionary of subjective words and phrases and measure their frequency. Well, no such dictionary exists. And even if it did, there's much more context that matters. So if I use the word alarming, or if I use the, you know, it, 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 if I use the word um, catastrophic, the, the context in which I'm using it might be important. And so we reject just the dictionary. We explored using existing language models. So there's, there's stuff out there um, uh, that measure uh, biased versus neutral tone language. There's fact checking models. That's not quite what we want. We want, we want to see if claims that are being made in science articles are falsifiable. That's what we care about. Um, and so, so nothing that's off the shelf works quite right for us. So what we do is we, be, we developed a rubric, rules about what's, you know, what, what triggers uh, us to mark something as subjective. And then we randomly select a bunch of sentences and abstracts from the 180,000. We, we pay graduate students to, to label the label sentences as um, subjective or objective. And then we apply that to the unseen data. So there's machine learning that transfers, you know, our labeling into evaluations of all of the abstracts. So it's pretty standard machine learning language modeling. And, and so the, the, the examples that get spit out of this process um, tell us that we're measuring the kind of thing we want to measure. So abstracts that are deemed subjective by the machine learning process include this list. I could show you more, but I just want to highlight what it's flagging as subjective. Environmental crisis, we use the word crisis a lot, um, uh, subjective statement. Um, massive degradation, subjective in both ways. Massive is not particularly measurable, and degradation depending on the context, could be an expression of personal feelings. Catastrophically short, urgency is obviously warranted. That's clearly a, a policy prescription. So this is the kind of thing that the, the model is flagging. Um, and so just as a counterexample, I want to give you an abstract that our, that our system deemed as very objective. And this is an explosive topic, so I think it's impressive that this abstract is objective. Um, and it's in the American Economic Review. I'm going to read it, just read it out loud to get, or, you know, so they say, we study singleton births to mothers residing within five kilometers of a Superfund site to examine the effect of Superfund cleanups um, on infant health between 1989 and 2003. 
Our empirical approach compares birth outcomes before and after site cleanup for mothers who live within 2,000 meters of the site and those who live between 2,000 and 5,000 meters of a site. We find that proximity to a Superfund site before cleanup is associated with a 20 to 25 percent increase in the risk of congenital anomalies. Okay, so waste, Superfund waste is really, ha I mean, it's, hazard it's hazardous. And you can easily imagine a abstract that built subjectivity into it in several components up front. Uh, you know, infant health is the, is the number one um, concern we have as a society. And then you could imagine on the back end, like, therefore, we need more funding for Superfund cleanup. And the authors resisted adding those statements and told us what they did, how they did it, and what they found. Okay, a pretty objective approach. Um, and that leads me to a quick aside, which I often lecture on the nature of research, research methodology. It's what I do for some of the organizations that um, Josh named when he introduced me that I'm affiliated with. Um, but research typically has these components, a clear question, a statement about why the question is important. What, do you, what are you going to study? What are you, how, and how are you going to, methodologically, what are you going to do? And then what can be concluded? There's actually like opportunities to add subjectivity into every component, certainly in the question. Um, you could ask a normative or positive question. So a normative question would be like, you know, should we put more resources to environmental protection? That's different than saying, you know, how have uh, this program that dedicated resources to the environment, how has it actually affected environmental quality? Um, why is it important? Uh, we've already talked about um, subjectivity in that. And then what can be concluded? Just because you find an empirical result doesn't mean you have a conclusive assessment of what, should, what policy should be enacted. It's not really your role as a researcher. Okay, so here's some data. Uh, here's some data from the study. So what do, what do we see? So the red line is the average subjectivity score over time for articles in environmental science, so nature, science, et cetera. And then the red line, or the blue line, is articles in economics journals that are about the environment. So what do you see? So uh, economics articles about the environment are, are less subjective. Um, than articles in interdisciplinary science journals um, that sometimes have social science co-authors but also hard science co-authors. But you see that um, subjectivity in economics is trending up on environmental topics. So if you look at regression analysis, and you say like, okay, statistical analysis, holding other things constant, like the experience of the authors, the number of authors, is it an empirical paper or a theoretical paper? There's other kinds of things we control for in this. Um, you see that um, both in economics journals and science journals, papers that are about the environment rather than about some other categories, uh, labor economics, for example, um, are, are more subjective even when you're controlling for other characteristics. So it's the norm in these disciplines and environmental research is to use more subjective language than elsewhere. And the topics that tend to have the highest levels of subjectivity are papers that are about pollution, papers that are about climate change, papers that are about health. And I, I'm, I'm interested in how uh, co the COVID episode affects this, but papers that are about health and the environment and that crossover use very subjective language. And then everything else is kind of a mix. You know, we don't see clear patterns if the paper's about electricity or water or species. Uh, well, species, you see a fair amount of subjectivity if it's about biodiversity. Um, and so that's, that's how, how, how topics play into this. Um, and, then, and then the last thing I'll say about the results from this paper, so what, you know, are there rewards for using this language. So there's, the, we, we, we see that they're more common in papers about the environment, especially climate, pollution, health, health in the environment, um, species as well. Um, but what about 
the impact of the paper? What about the impact of the research?